Good morning and welcome to this Growth Through Innovation webinar brought to you by the Mid-South West Region as part of this year's Global Entrepreneurial Week. For those of you who may not know, Mid-South West is a collaboration between Armagh City, Banbridge and Craigavon Borough Council, Fermanagh and Oma District Council and Mid-Ulster District Council. Innovation has become such so important to businesses as many adapt to a fast changing world to ensure they remain sustainable and have a competitive edge. Innovation is about creating business value, which, and this can be achieved through incremental improvements to existing products, the creation of entirely new products or services, or by reducing costs. Innovation plays a critical role in any successful economy, and it is never more apparent than across this reason. Today, we are collaborating with the aim of showcasing business leaders from within our region. They will talk us through our how innovation has helped them grow their businesses. It is my pleasure to introduce Clodagh Rice to lead the conversation with today's panel, Colin and Stephen and Terry. Listen to what drives them and discover what can be achieved with an innovation mindset. Despite the turbulent times and environment, environment that businesses are operating within, one of the initiatives led by the Mid-South West Collaboration is a pilot business innovation programme which is aimed at supporting participating businesses from across the region on their innovation journey. Shortly, we will play a video highlighting some of the businesses from the region that have benefited from this pilot program. I hope today's webinar leaves you feeling inspired, boosts your aspirations, and helps to supercharge the economy across the Mid-South West region. Enjoy the webinar and thank you. The Business Innovate Programme supports businesses across the Mid-South West region to grow, develop and bring their innovations to life. Northern Ireland is a small place but it is massive for opportunities. The programme is providing us with a specialist with 20 years experience. We've developed a product, but for it to really take off, we need that experience so we can get a really viable product. Having his industry experience has helped us to understand what things we could do better and how to maximise profitability and production. I would say that if you're considering the programme Especially this particular one is all about innovation, innovation and decarbonisation. And you mightn't think you could apply that to your business, but sometimes you don't know, and that's what the programme's about. But sometimes you need someone to break it down into the basics of AMA language, and you're like, well, yeah, well, I could use that there. I can see where that would work now. Business innovation programme is key to businesses like ourselves. It allows us to really set aside the time and the resources that we can focus on our continued development. Innovation is, is complicated, it's hard, it's tricky. So programs like this are fantastic in both identifying what you need to do and also then helping you actually put those measures in place to ultimately enable innovation. What we've done is positively disrupt the supply chain from day one, but there's loads more we can do. So the program really helped us dig deep into what we could do, what we could offer existing customers, what new customers we could bring on board and how that will affect the business going forward in terms of revenue and growth which ultimately would mean grow our team and employment. We want to be able to create sustainable jobs and continue growth for this area. We need new ideas from new people and innovation is at the heart of that. The advice that I would give to someone who's thinking of enrolling in the Business Innovation Programme is to do it. It is a fantastic way to further your company's goals, be those in terms of environmental, decarbonisation or whatever innovation your particular company wants to do. Hello and welcome. I hope you can all hear me okay. Uh, my name is Clodagh Rice. I'm the business correspondent at BBC Northern Ireland. And uh, thank you to Councillor Sam Nicholson there for the warm welcome. Um, so I'm looking forward to having a chat with some business leaders here now. But just first, before we start, a couple of housekeeping notes. 
Um, this Zoom is being recorded so that people can watch it. It will be put up on the council's website, but they won't be able to see or hear you. So you don't need to worry about that. But we would still love um, anyone in the audience to get involved. If you see on your Zoom panel, there should be a question and answer box. And I'll be able to put all of your questions to our business leaders. So we'd love to get them uh, throughout the discussion. Um, so let's kick things off. Uh, we're joined by Colin Edgar from CET Cryospas, Terry Mullen from Global Ed Automation and Stephen Smith from TCTS Group. Um, Colin, if we start with yourself, uh, I know that you have had quite a journey. Um, whenever we spoke previously, you had described it. Um, you know, you've managed to innovate your way from initial horse spas to now working with huge names like like Man United. Um, can you talk us through, you know, some of the key parts of your own journey? Uh, yes. Well, yes, we started doing hydrotherapy for horses for treating tendon and ligament injuries. And then we had a lot of uh, footballers, like uh, Gaelic footballers in Ireland, uh, using the horse spas and saying how good it was. So that, so that, that was back uh, in 2000, 2002 that we started that business. Um, so in 2007, we started working uh, on, on developing a, a human version. And we developed what we now call our cryo spa. And that is, um, we have that now in over, over 40 uh, countries. And uh, you know, recently um, we've supplied guitar, you know, for the World Cup. Uh, we have it there in the training facility, which is open to all the players, as well as the uh, the stadiums where they're playing the games. So, so um, I think now we have over forty countries, and our biggest markets currently are China and uh, the Middle East. Um, um, Pre-COVID, uh, we, we did a lot in, in Europe, but Europe hasn't really recovered post-COVID, at least not in our sector. Um, but since since then, we, we developed a totally new product, um, which is um, uh, it's basically cooling the palms of the hands um, in order to uh, um, have a strength and conditioning impact. So this is the product that I probably focus on more uh, this morning because it's to uh, uh, probably no one will have heard of it. Um, <laughs> yeah, we could maybe get a little bit more about yeah. that um, later on. We're just okay. going through a few introductions at this point. Terry, would you mind talking us through what role innovation has played in, in your journey as well? Oh, I think you might be on mute, Terry. Yeah, yeah. how do we call it now? <laughs> That's okay, we can hear you now, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much, Clara. Yeah, so I'm Terry Mullen from Global Automation. So um, I suppose innovation forms a big part of what we do as your business uh, generally. Um, as automation is almost always involved in some innovative uh, way in terms of like machine design, development, and technologies, you know, the industry itself is always innovating. Um, you know, new technologies and systems are coming online, you know, every year. And the, and the the business is really dynamic in that sense. So we get a lot of exposure to both, you know, using the latest innovations, but also seeing other people's innovation journeys, um, you know, so where they have a concept or they have a design and bringing that to, to fruition, uh, we, we often get involved in that sort of uh, part of it. Uh, for ourselves, it's obviously been key. And I suppose innovation, there's like so many ways of, of looking at it, you know, where it's working practices, you know, Intern systems within your business, um, or actually a new product or something that you're developing. You know, so it's a it's a big part of I suppose every business now. Uh, but I suppose we, we get an opportunity based on the sector we are um, to see a lot of it. You know, in, in other companies as well. Yeah. And Stephen, would you do the same? Could you just introduce yourself for us and talk about how innovation has helped you up until this point? Yes, absolutely. Good morning. Uh, my name is Stephen Smith from TCTS Group, and um, we have currently about to launch our new global software called Compliance Pal um, Software. So our business, we specialize in transport compliance um, with transport logistics, warehousing, uh, manufacturing companies. We provide support packages uh, from health and safety to operators license, tachographs, uh, and training. So we have six divisions within our company um, to present. Now, within that industry, although it is the backbone of everything, no matter what anybody thinks, I think COVID really highlighted the importance of transport and logistics. 
Um, it's it, it's a very fast moving pace, but we're still well in the dark ages of technology. So coming forward from that, we've seen such a, I'm not even going to say a gap in the market. We actually approach so many people um, regarding innovation to try and get them involved. So we did resell a number of products um, over maybe six to 10 years. And them companies would not go outside the box. You know, they seem to be just stuck in the rut all the time. So it got to the stage where we had to then just bite the bullet and go into software ourselves, a field that I knew nothing about, a field that I didn't want to be involved in, really. And um, we just end up having to go down that route, um, employer-owned software developers, and then get involved with external providers to try and bridge that gap um, of, of innovation and technology, which, believe it or not, in the transport sector, logistic and warehousing sectors, um, it's very limited. It is very limited. Yeah. Well, um, just to pick up on one point you meant, you said there about kind of noticing a gap in the market. Um, Colin, I know that that is something that you had uh, talked about in terms of palm cooling. And I know you had quite an interesting journey in terms of how you came up with that idea on a flight. Uh, could you talk us more about that? Yeah. Well, well, it started uh, whenever I uh, was on a, a design thinking course at Stanford University. It was just like a one day course. And when I was this professor who um, had done a lot of research on uh, dress for the US military, and they developed this palm cooling glove, basically commonly called the Stanford glove. And uh, he said that had some issues with uh, product, you know, manufacturing at that point which you know, indicated there's maybe an opportunity there. And then a few months later, I was at, uh, in Stockholm at Hammerby Football Club install, installing some of our cryo spa ice baths. And coincidentally, the head sports event has mentioned that they had a Stanford glove. And I asked them, well, you know, uh, how do you find it? And he said, well, they liked it in principle, but it was too slow. And he asked me if we could look at developing something that was faster acting. And so then I flew from Stockholm to Munich and, it was, and I saw on that flight that I designed what became our core TX palm cooling product. Um, so, so then COVID struck, so it was difficult to go and meet with the customer, which is essential. I'm, I'm sure everybody will agree that talking to the customers and getting feedback is crucial during the innovation process. So, so that was more difficult because of COVID. And then we, we launched the, the website sort of for this time last year. And we, we got a couple of inquiries, uh, one from a doctor at Harvard University, who was the um, uh, athlete, sorry, uh, um, gymnastics and wrestling coach. And because of our background in, in low temperature hydrotherapy, we were using convection to cool the palm, i.e. we're wet, getting the palm wet. And because the uh, the um, the athletes were talking their, 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 their palms and they were taping their fingers, they needed to keep their hands dry. So that meant that we had to um, rethink the product. At this time, we had all from uh, the head osteopath at um, Aeneas Grenadiers. They were previously called Team Sky, the professional cycling team that have won the Tour de France, I guess, seven times now in the last 11 years. And the head osteopath happens to be Irish, and he contacted us about a, a separate issue. Uh, they were interested in palm cooling, uh, basically to manage heat stress. They, they were at the Vuelta in Spain, and it was 40 degrees. And uh, they wanted something they could use on the coach. So at the end of today's stage, whenever they drive to the hotel for, you know, close to the start of tomorrow's stage, that coach journey could be an hour or two hours long. And so they wanted something that they could use on the coach. Um, so I went something that didn't involve uh, water and uh, was portable. So we had to go right to the drawing board. Um, uh, and that's how we've come up with the sort of second iteration for our palm cooling product. Um, and so speaking of going right back to the drawing board, I'm I'm sure there will be some people listening to this. I mean, hopefully, you know, maybe working in a business and they do have an idea. What is your advice on how to get it from that kind of drawing board stage to actually, be, you know, it becoming a reality? This manufacturing, um, so so it's it, um, you have to make a, a, a physical product that uh, that you can use. Um, now uh, during the design phase, the 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 uh, conventional wisdom is that you 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 do drawings first and talk to customers. 
but when you when you have a product which in, uh, basically uh, people won't know anything about and they won't believe it works you almost have to have a physical working product so they that they can Pretty feel it bit. and and uh, yeah. yeah and pr- yes and, you know um so and ahead. terry can i put the same question to you i appreciate you know it depends on the industry you're working in it depends on whether it's a product or a service but i mean on that kind of point of getting something from an idea to to a reality what would your tips be um, I think it's uh, we, we spoke about this earlier actually uh, with Stephen we, we was talking about it and you know it's it's that thing of doing the research you know um, you have to be anticipated to uh, anticipate that you're going to have failures you're going to have problems with what you're doing if you're really being innovative in terms of a design or a product you know if it is something that hasn't been done before there's going to be lots and lots of challenges and you know you need to just be prepared to make mistakes learn from them and, and move on um and that's, sure people you know, will you know if there's anyone listening will think they're they're glad to hear it from established businesses like yourself you know to say yeah. that it is okay to make mistakes and you're you know that's all part of the kind of innovation journey i guess yeah without a doubt um and like you know the the, the other thing about innovation is like you know it it can be so difficult because um Again, if you're doing something that's outside your normal sphere, you may have spotted a gap on the market, as Colin was talking about there, or an opportunity, as Stephen mentioned as well. You know, the opportunity could be there, but that doesn't mean that you're an expert in, on, on delivering that. And that's something you have to evolve it's in, uh, within your own business, with your, you, you, you know, your employees and whoever is helping you on that innovation journey. And uh, I know Stephen probably talk about it after a while here, you know, yeah. about getting the right people <laughs> and getting <laughs> partnerships in terms of alignment with people that suppose are on the same wavelength as you and have the same vision as you are very, very important, um, you know. Yeah, we can maybe bring Stephen in at that point. I know um, Terry was referring to your own example there, Stephen, just in terms of of some of the challenges whenever you are trying to come up with something um, that might slow down the process and things like that that you were chatting to us about a bit earlier yeah well i think um just even to follow up on that that last question is uh, from a from an innovative point of view is to always start with the end you know with the end in mind and work back because your end product it might sound so mad to everybody else but you know that it needs to be done so when you have the end in mind and work your way back um i find that it's, it's easier to do it that way and then when you're starting to map out what you need to do one of the big things that I have learned um, over a four-year period with, with uh, development of software and, and the innovative project that we have at the moment is the likes of a software developer, um, they're there to develop software and code. So I thought at the start it was a matter of telling them roughly what my idea was, give it to them, and they'll just code and build it. But the bottom line is they can't because they don't know exactly what's in your head. So you have to get it out of your head and onto, onto the bit of paper. So that really led us down the, the track of resourcing out um, developers. And that was that was the most difficult bit because Google is great, but Google can be manipulated very, very quickly. A nice shiny brochure can be developed. A nice shiny website can be developed. So it's a matter of drilling down into what the company that you're going to you know, go with uh, can do. And remember, a lot of them, as I say, is a shiny website. So I would always advise people that you need to get external advice and guidance with that. And do not be afraid of ask anybody. You know, if the likes of Terry and Colin there, if you know them in any way at all, do not be afraid to lift the phone and ask them for an hour of their time, um, same as ourselves, and take that hour because these guys aren't going to give you a sales pitch because we're not selling um, building you know, development for you. But we can give a lot of advice of uh, the the failures that we've had along the way, and the failures are massive. You know, don't don't get me wrong. But with the end in mind and the goal in mind, well, then you're just going to keep going and keep going and keep going. And when you finish a project and look back, you think to yourself, "What the hell made me keep working at that?" Because there are so many failures. Yeah, and I suppose is that part of the challenge as well? If you are so committed to an idea, or or a particular version of an idea, you know, maybe your first version or your third version. You know, is it about having the kind of experience or wisdom to kind of think, I've got to cut my losses here or something has got to change in order to make this work? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we're all customer driven. And I think that's the big thing. We're all, you know, there's a, we have customers to satisfy. Our customers have needs. 
And when you don't see a product out there, it gets to a stage where it just has to happen and somebody's going to have to do it. Um, so I think really what keeps you driven is the fact that it's still needed. Now, when it gets to a stage where it's not needed or somebody else maybe gets a step ahead of you, if you don't have the passion and interest in what you're doing, forget about it. Let somebody else pick it up. You know, sell your idea to an investor, do whatever you want. But without that passion and drive behind it, um, you're not going to build a very good product. You know, the developer can code, but they don't have the background or experience of what you can bring to that particular product. Yeah. And I should just uh, remind everybody at this point, you know, as as Stephen was very generously offering his own time, we we can take questions now from the panelists and they are anonymous. If there's anything that you would like to ask or anything that might be specific to your own sector, um, please do keep those questions coming through. And um, Terry, I wanted to bring you in because I could see you nodding away there at, at Stephen's mm -hmm. point. Have you had some experience of kind of thinking like, you know, yeah. it's it's not an easy decision to make, but we're going to have to to maybe you know let go of an idea. Yeah, surely. Um, I, th I think one of the, the the key points out of what um, Stephen was saying there, which really resonated to me, was about this thing of having a design and then getting the implementation of that. And that's something again that we have learned is that you know there's probably two different elements to that. The design has to be your design of what you want, and Stephen's very right in saying that you know you have to get your your vision or your um, your idea of what the design is across to who's helping you with that or actually implementing the design. But there's also another phase of that, and that could be like it's a product, it could be the manufacture of that product, or it could be the, the, the design or development or the coding of software or some system like that there. But very often those are two very separate things. And sometimes that it's a, it can be like a trap that we fall into in terms of, we go to someone and they may have be an expert in software development or that, but it's not about the design of the system as such. So I think I say it's one of the things that I found from uh, the, the, a recent uh, program we're doing here through Middlester, um, where we got help from, we're, we're developing an internal system to help with our work management. And the first stage about it was all about defining the actual work management system itself. And then we decided how we were going to implement that. So there's two different roles in that. And it's, it's actually really relevant as well for uh, product design, because in terms of manufacture, you can have a great manufacturing company, but they may not have the design element and you can have a great design co uh, company and they may not have the actual, uh, the, the, the manufacturing capabilities or the, the means of actually realizing that as a product, which is again, you know, like a, a, like a big, gonna have a big impact on your innovation. If that's what you're driving towards, you know, and that's an awful where a lot of a lot of the frustration and sort of you know where we're getting held up and things aren't making progress. Uh, maybe it's the design stage because that's um, it's not as you perceived it, or the design is 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 fine and it's maybe how the end product has looked or finished up, you know, whatever that yeah. is. Yeah. Well, um, I wanted to also ask uh, all of you about what role you think sales and marketing can play. I know, Colin, you had mentioned because your product is something that um, people didn't know about, you know, is that a challenge when it comes to kind of uh, marketing something? You need to be very explicit in terms of trying to, um, you know, raise awareness of the technology, but also you're you're still trying to sell it at the end of the day. Yeah, well, 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 we've been pioneering on all our products, but I just would like to pick up on a couple of points made earlier because one of the one of the, mis the mistake mistake we make is to try to um, satisfy every possible eventuality at the beginning, and what you really do is what's called the minimum viable product. So you do the, the simplest product that you can present to potential customers and get feedback. Uh, because the end goal uh, might change en route as ours has and, and almost inevitably there's changes once you start to get that customer feedback. So it's, it's so doing it's better 90% done than 100% not done. So, so just getting uh, uh, enough in order to be able to get feedback is really, really crucial. Now, I've forgotten your question about sales and marketing. <laughs> well, um, yeah, it was just so, so they, I appreciate if you're working in different <laughs> sectors or, you know, different functions will have different levels of importance. But I just, uh, what struck me was the fact that you had said, you know, part of the challenge of going out to sell it is whenever people don't know what it does or they might not believe that it works, that, you know, is that yeah. part of the challenge trying to prove it? 
Well, well, yeah, there's two elements. One, one is actually uh, focusing on a particular market. So our palm cooling could be elite sport, it could be health clubs, it could be military, it could be firefighting. You know, there's lots of different potential markets and actually focus, you know, choosing one to focus on yeah. and, and uh, failing fast. If that's the wrong sector, let's find out <laughs> fast. Yeah, and not so waste, you don't waste you know, not, too many time, too much time and resources on it. Correct. So, so um, get, getting as much feedback as possible. Um, it's been difficult with COVID, when, when, whenever it's a physical product that people need to feel. Um, it, it, um, you know, we, um, just talking about it in theory isn't as good as getting it in front of someone so they can uh, see the benefits. Yeah, see it. Well, it's funny that you mentioned COVID was a challenge there because I think it was Stephen had suggested that actually the pandemic brought up a lot of opportunities. Um, is is that right? That was what you had said earlier. Was how did the pandemic impact your own journey? Yeah, absolutely. Um, within so we cover so many areas, and um, as Colin said, there you you know you have to focus on one, and it's very easy for. Um, you know, we, we deal with enforcement and blue light and, and um, health and safety and all these all these different sectors. And you have to focus on the one particular area of it. And that really went back to transport and logistics because transport and logistics and warehousing, you can't sit at home on a computer and load trucks, <laughs> you know. So with the technology coming in, um, you know, and, and trying to drive that forward, a lot of companies realize very quickly that they now, need to digitalize all their systems, their paperwork, their information. And when by digitalize, I don't mean put it in a shared folder for the company to see. I mean digitalization so that it's it's increasing productivity and decreasing downtime. So when the pandemic came in within transport and logistics, especially, and even the delivery of you know last mile logistics, should we say to, to the door and leaving the product at the door and getting a signature, all them days were gone. And to be honest, they're probably gone now, but taking a picture um, beside a, a gnome at the back door and then your, your package going missing just wasn't good enough. And that brought in brought into play um, GPS uh, location drops, you know, the likes of what three words not, and it made, it made it massive. So the upside of COVID is that so many industries just turned around and said, we've had enough, we need to go, di we, we need, yeah. need to go digital, really. And that they're open to a hell of a lot of opportunities. From us personally, for our on-site support packages, um, as I say, we have customers in Northern Ireland, Southern Ireland, throughout GB, into Portugal and Spain. You know, we're, we're starting to move well into the EU. But that work only came because we could do so much with remotely, you know, yeah. and set up systems for people and then make them aware that they can have all on one platform. And then that can be digitalized and repeated throughout throughout any uh, organization or any location that they have. So it was massive, Claude. It was, it was a massive um, game changer for us. And um, we've had a question here about uh, hydrogen powered systems. So I could maybe ask uh, each of you how if that might apply to you. But I'm thinking particularly, uh, Stephen, for yourself, first of all, in terms of transport, you know, do you think that there are opportunities there for for Mid Ulster? We're we're so far behind in in technology that way I, I believe and if somebody is looking from start to finish so from the development of it to the infrastructure of it is that's the game changer. Other companies are only looking at very small bits, very small bits of it. Now the government are pushing for more green. Um, transport and logistics are being hammered all the time over the carbon footprint, and they are working massively. Like we have some distribution clients um, with large, large sites, and they are busting themselves to try and get the, um, you know, their carbon footprint down because they're now starting to get penalties and there's a lot of clauses in it. So yes, that sort of technology is, is massive, but someone needs to lead it, and they need to take it from start to finish. Um, instead of just focusing on one particular bit of it. Now, as Colin and, and Terry mentioned earlier, that could be involving other parties, you know, because you don't know everything and you will never know everything. So if you bring in a specialist, say, from a vehicular side um, into the likes of a uh, facility side and put them together with your idea, um, because your vision should never change. You know, as Colin says, the end goal might change, but your vision should never change. If anything, your, vis your vision should get bigger not smaller because you see all these opportunities coming about. So yes, that the technology, it's, we're sitting waiting for it. We're begging for it. And I mean, Terry, to put the same point to you, I mean, I guess 
we know there are so many opportunities related to um, hydrogen or or to renewables, but is it about trying to, um, you know, to, to steal what Stephen said, you know, someone to kind of lead that that movement? Yeah, I think so. Like, and I think it, it needs strategic leadership. You know, um, you know, as a general thing, I'll come back to specifically to the, the hydrogen thing because of, I have a bit of experience in terms of working alongside that. Um, it, in this sort of area that we're in here, like if you're talking about the, the South Mid Midwest or Mid Ulster, you know, there's a, there's a vast array of really dynamic, enthusiastic people there, and there's a real good sort of history of people being innovative and being, you know, preparing to put themselves out there to actually, you know, create something, you know, start a business um, and, and be innovative. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the things that I've sort of learned is that working in partnership or working with each other, you know, having good relationship with other business sectors, uh, companies, and so right across the region is so, so important so that I think as Stephen and, and Colin alluded to earlier on, you know, it's this thing of having to fight in people that can do specific tasks or jobs or elements of what you want to do in terms of the, um, your innovation, which will help you and help them as well, you know. But relate, relating to specifically uh, the hydrogen, we, we, we've sort of been involved in a project which is sort of like using the byproduct of the creation of that, which is separating that, uh, the hydrogen and oxygen and using the actual oxygen for another purpose. You know, which in this case was um, uh, what wastewater treatment. You know, so uh, you know the, the the innovations are out there, and I say local companies are are doing their best. But uh, like a good strategic approach in terms of you know programs and 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 assistance and maybe some leadership as well would be um, really a you know a big advantage to, to to the whole region. And can I put the same point to you, Colin, um, in terms of hydrogen or, you know, opportunities? Are there any, um, you know, I'm thinking of your kind of heating and cooling. Is, are there any kind of alternative um, opportunities for yourself? Mm, not, not, not really related to hydrogen, but the, the general point I would make is that I, I would rather have hydrogen than an electric vehicle, you know, somewhere I can go and just fill up. Um, rather than going somewhere and then waiting hours to charge to recharge, and um, you're not going to drive to Cork, you know, and back, you know, with an electric vehicle. Um, so, so, so I think that, uh, but hydrogen requires a government decision, you know, and that, it really is a, um, not for an individual company. But I think ultimately, I I believe hydrogen will become the you know uh, more. Um, uh, the, the the default energy source than than yeah. uh, electric than sort of EVs, um, but I have no no knowledge or experience of it. But just from a user point of view, <laughs> I, I like the idea of just driving. Would, yeah, that would be your up. preference. Yeah, um, I think I think Claude, sorry, the yeah. uh, with hydrogen with you know vehicles themselves. Um, uh, we have a lot of large clients here in GB that's operating them. They they sit in the corner of the yard. To, to be honest, you know, they sit there to take a box um, for their their government expectations. And they only sit there for the simple reason is that when we get the summertime, you know, there's a lot of them that's breaking down because the external sensors don't match the internal sensors and they've more breakdown. They're off the road more than they're on the road. And um, it's amazing to see some large companies sitting maybe six to 10 trucks in the corner, um, brand new vehicles maybe, whether they're hired or owned, and they're sitting there just to take a box. So Colin's right as well, you know, it's, it's how, how far do people want to go with that? The idea is absolutely brilliant, but who's looking at the bigger picture of it? Where are these trials? Where are these tests? You know, a test on a, on a, on a test track in Germany is completely irrelevant to coming here to Northern Ireland. Or the, or yeah, the, should they be testing them in Mid-Ulster? Uh, Mid-Ulster, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Put, putting the nodes that they run on every day and, um, you know, putting them into real life uh, um, testing. Scenarios, and, yeah. You know, I've been involved in a lot of vehicle testing over the years. I'm 27 years of this crack and um you know the likes of wind tunnels and all they amaze me I'm, I'm massive into that aerodynamics i love all that stuff however it's not the real world it's not the real world when you're trying to you know deliver at distribution centers and um you know as and i call it so right there this trickle charging and this supercharging uh, as i say i'm in gb here at the moment and i was in the services last week and um there was 10 charging points but only two of them worked 
And, you know, you have guys there parked on yeah. days and it's just, unless the infrastructure, and this is the problem we're going to have, and we do have at the moment in, in Mid Ulster, is that the infrastructure just isn't there for electric alone. Uh, yeah. anything else. So um, innovation from that side is, is massive. And just to really clarify my point of getting people involved, if you have a brilliant idea for, for that part, um, but you don't know how to how to maybe add it into to another category, like like Terry said. Well, then go and seek help from a professional in that side. We, I think, I don't know if it's Northern Ireland thing, but we all think that everybody's going to steal our ideas. So, so <laughs> keep them hidden. But the problem is, without that driver, without that founder, without that person with the um, passion to get it going, anybody can steal it, but they'll never make a job of it. It's only yeah. the people that want to innovate. Well, also, I mean, actually, that's something that ha that I know that you've all said, you know, in terms of the importance of kind of reaching out to people who do have the skills and knowledge if you do have a gap in your own experience, you know, um, which is quite nice to hear, I guess, for, you know, just to kind of like be less wary, maybe, or be more open to, to working together. And um, we've had a question here um, going back to the marketing question, just to say that it would be useful to hear from the panel what their tops tips would be um, in terms of where they are like more, more likely to spend their money remarketing and PR in the coming year. Um, I don't know if any or all of you would like to answer that one. We just uh, took on a, a, for the first time ever, really, a, a top London PR company for a new, new product launch. Mm -hmm. And it was a decision because of the um, the, the, you know you're committing to a monthly expense without uh, knowing any return um but the connections that they have uh, they specialize in only health and fitness uh, products so they so they're not a general pr company but the connections that they that they have are fabulous and it was as introducing us to people because they're representing in fact they're representing potential clients of ours yes. um and uh, uh, like david Lloyd Leisure, for example, and so it was, uh, uh, we found that by actually um, committing to that, um, we got a, a lot of connections that we that if we'd gone for a PR company, I'm not I'm not criticizing local PR companies, but uh, because of the connections that they had, and also because the journalists, you know, for the national newspapers and so forth, maybe are based, uh, you know, the uh, the top journalists maybe are, based, are London based. So, so we need somewhere where we can do demonstrations and everything. So it will vary from uh, you know industry to industry and what your target market is. But for us, the um, if we're targeting health clubs, of course, there's a lot more in uh, GB than there is in Ireland. Um, so, so um, it just made sense for us to commit to that. So, we only start the first of, of October. So you maybe ask me that question, you know, in a couple of months' time. We'll <laughs> yes, yeah, see. You, see Six months I, or twelve I months, how, how it's going? Yeah. Um, Terry, what about yourself? Uh, well, I suppose in terms of marketing, it wouldn't be a shamed example of of, of uh, how best to do it. Um, the, the the sort of sector or the industry we have um, is is pretty much based on demand, um, and where we sort of position ourselves is we like to be at the you know the, the sort of the current age of technologies is what we're looking for. Um, but that sector changes. Um, so while it could be in sort of machine building this year, could be the, the, the growth area, uh, we, we would try to target that. Where it's in um, sort of like utilities, we would try to target that as well. You know what I mean? So it does change. I suppose in marketing, um, the, 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 again, where we're, we're looking at where we've made sort of mistakes and things we do improve on is, is to get a clear vision of, of what, you know, where you're going with it. And I mean, that means in terms of your business as well, because um, I know it's slightly different maybe for the likes of Colin here, he's got a product and he, he, he's looking for yeah. opportunities to sell it. Well, well, if we move into a sector, we have to provide the services associated with that. So that means having the workforce and the skills and the, the technologies in-house to provide the, the, the backup and the, and the support to do that. So it's a bigger sort of a long-term sort of, how would you call it, um, process yeah. but uh, again sort of moves on to maybe something you're going to talk about later on maybe um sort of is about you know having the right people uh you know in, in your business to uh, to adapt to that and be able to take up you know take on any growth that you have you know based on that so the market is really part of your overall process in terms of your, your growth 
or your anticipated uh, growth over the coming years, you know? Yeah. And Stephen, what about yourself? Well, I was about to jump into Colin there and say, no, Colin, don't be going down that route. But you know, <laughs> I suppose it depends on, you know, it might be a different fit for a different... No, well, he, he hit the nail on the head then that he has um, teamed up with somebody in GB because we're struggling here in Northern Ireland to have marketing and PR companies that um, can deliver. Now, I can only speak from my experiences, but a lot of our clients, I sit on their boards and um, I go through their marketing strategies with them. And you deal with these guys that, and Colin's so right, it's another cost to the business. So because somebody's serving me, um, delivering me a service, I will KPI them from the start to the finish. I want aims, objectives, and timelines. Because if we don't do that, people just take a hand all the time to think, well, sure, listen, we, we'll do a wee bit of it. Um, what is the end objective? You know, is, as Colin says, he's, gonna, he's dealing with somebody who's specializing in the area Colin wants to go for. And that's absolutely fantastic. And that's what you need. However, Colin will hopefully think in the back of his mind, but I'm going to have to put down timelines and deadlines of what you're delivering for me. And I need the evidence of, of what we're seeing. So from a marketing point, um, I think we'll have to all jump on board the, the social media train because that's just where it is now. And it's the, it's the silly things like TikTok. That's yeah. more revenue from marketing than it is um, with anything else. Now, for example, in our own YouTube channel, which is TCTS Group TV, like and subscribe, <laughs> um, and, uh, on our own YouTube channel, I went and met with these marketing guys, and there were all these gurus, and this is Northern Ireland, they're all gurus of all this, and we have more followers than them. We, you know, we're putting out more content to them um, on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, all that. And you have to sit down and say to yourself, how can you be a guru in this field? And we have more followers and subscribers than you. And I, th I think that's a very relevant question. And it'll lead on to what we might talk about later on about getting external help about the professionalism. So Yeah, well, funny. I mean, just on that point, because funny, that's sort of exactly what Terry was alluding to there as well. I suppose you both have... Um, contrasting um, experiences in terms of marketing PR, whether it's Colin looking for an external agency or Stephen in your own you know, YouTube channel. I mean, on that point of you know, either making sure you have the right skills, the right staff to do it internally, is it then a challenge? As I know, um, Stephen, you know, you haven't had the most positive experiences when you then do bring in an external force and they don't have the experience you'd been hoping for. Unfortunately, yes. If we had if we had six hours of, of a webinar, I could explain. <laughs> yeah. um, absolutely. And I fell into the trap of presuming that these guys knew what they were doing. Now they're meant to come in as a professional and you shouldn't you shouldn't need to question them. And you can't question on their technical ability because that's where their skill set lays. However, you can question them on the aims and objectives of what they're going to produce for you. Yeah. But you need to put in deadlines. You need to put in a timeline. You know, we're going back to the old Gantt chart sort of thing. What are you going to have done by next Friday? And yeah. when next Friday comes, you must report to me. And I, I find that we're, we're all, we're, when we're in the process, we're all very um, so grateful of any help. OK, but you have to remember you're paying for this help. So therefore, they work for you. And you want it to be the right help. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and they work for you. And, you know, it's it's a matter of um, you seeing the, the clear difference. You know, you, you see what they can bring to you. Yeah. Um, we've been in, you know, involved with a number of uh, software development companies and all. And although they're great people, they do not have the skill set. They do not have the experience. And within the first couple of months, I, I thought that. But what would I know? Because I, I'm not a coder. I know nothing about yeah. software. However, if I'd have monitored the way we're monitored and now our four year project would have been finished in 12 months. And now talking about the, uh, the uh, innovation growth, the context that we made through this program has actually just um, catapulted our process because that gave us good contact somewhere else and they know the way that we work. So I think question each and every every bit of it. Um, yeah. We are also an Invest NI client and um, you know, we're very grateful for Invest NI to come on board. However, um, it's been <clears throat> a terrible experience. You know, I, it, I wouldn't recommend it and we won't be going back down that route for the simple reason is they're the, the same themselves. They don't have the technical experience. They don't have the skilled staff in the background and um, it's a prolonged project, you know? So yeah. it's, you have to understand where your external help's coming from. And it's the same thing again. The country's full of external providers. 
So why not more or less tender them? Why not bring them in? If somebody comes... Like, don't, be a, don't be afraid to maybe speak out if you aren't happy with how things are going and look exactly. for, for yeah. additional help. Um, Terry, does that tie into your point that you were hoping to make about you know the importance of, of finding the right staff? I suppose that's whether it's someone you're hiring or someone that you are are, are dealing with um, you know, for a particular project. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, I think that having the right staff, you know, is is really, you know, uh, it's so so important, and it's getting so so much harder to do, um, particularly where, where we are and where, where we're based, um, and like you know, it's, it's it's how to attract those people, and how to provide them with a role that is you know in lines aligns with what their vision is of their career. You know what I mean? That's the, that's it's really really hard to do. Um, you know, as business, you know, managers, directors, whatever we are, um, you know, our focus is on growing the business and obviously the bottom line and trying to, you know, grow what we have and to, to you know, as, as, we, as we evolve. But, you know, we can't do that without really, really good people. And, you know, the, the COVID thing has really highlighted how important I think staff are to everybody. And, yeah. you know, again, I would point back to sort of the middle sort of thing, you know, there's a, a wealth of talent there, but a lot of it is moving towards the city, for example. And I would like to see us, you know, focusing on keeping that that workforce, you know, in the area and providing, yeah. you know, like innovation hubs, you know, uh, technology hubs, all these sort of things that, that we can all sort of use and, you know, will attract more people inwards rather than um, losing or sort of... Uh, our, our workforce, you know, to, to, to the cities, to Dublin, to, to, to Belfast, that sort yeah. of thing, you know, um, um, you know. I will, I want to, I know we don't have a massive amount of time left, but I want to bring in Colin at this point, because I know you've done something a bit unusual to uh, keep your own staff happy by cutting down to a four day a week. How's that been going? Um, really well. <laughs> Um, yes, everybody loves it. We, we, we went to sort of uh, four slightly longer days. And um, obviously, um, three, a three-day weekend is very attractive. Um, we only started the 1st of October, uh, but our October uh, production was on a par with um, previous months. So, it, so the actual production level did not drop, which is really, the uh, uh, in theory, that's what should happen. But we have actually experienced that happening. But yes, the um, the idea is that your staff turnover drops substantially because someone working a four day week doesn't want to go to a five day week. Um, but there's been, there's a lot of research in different countries that have um, sort of proven that that uh, productivity is not does not drop off because you you change to a four day week. But I just want to make one point about um, uh, going back to to what was said earlier uh, in terms of support. If, if you especially if you're in the high tech or software product catalyst is a fantastic organization and they're part funded by invest and i and when you know i've been to stanford and mit and different um, places in the us um on on catalyst projects then there's a huge amount of support there um plus if, especially if you're in software there's a uh, there's a, a lot of other companies will be that you can connect with and you'll you start to like really learn from them. But also um, recently, I mean, there's so much support in Northern Ireland now. Like, you know, we're getting money from everywhere uh, for stuff that we never previously could get money for. Like, um, you know, we're getting money from for IP, you know, for patents and so forth from Invest NI. Um, there's a lot of innovative funds, you know, from the, well, for, in our case, it's Armagh Banbridge Council, but I'm sure it's the same right across the region. But there's a lot of funding if uh, if you have some innovative products. And so I'm talking to, um, you know, Intertrade Ireland, uh, Invest yeah. NI, Catalyst. Um, there's um, a lot of resources out there correct. To, to help um, I've been asked one that I'm going to put to all three of you although I'm not sure if this will be one as Stephen had joked we might need another six hours for this um, and I appreciate that we're running out of time but this one just says do you find political representatives a help or hindrance when you're trying to grow and recruit staff um, Stephen would you have anything to say on that one 
I would say absolutely not keep them away. <clears throat> as far as <laughs> um, and I'll tell you for the only reason why is because we're still in Northern <laughs> Ireland. And unfortunately, Northern Ireland still has, we still have the whole issues with Northern Ireland. So I find it, especially with GB and Southern Ireland customers, that they still trace them back to whatever party they're from. That leads into another conversation, into another conversation. So my generation has been the generation which has put us, you know, just stopped it, put a line through it and says, listen, we need to move on here. So yes. um, to be fair, I've dealt with a lot of them. Um, I am a member of the Leaders Council of Northern Ireland, Great Britain. And um, it all depends on their background, you know. It, or if they have nothing to bring to the table, well, then step aside because it's an absolute hindrance. Um, and then there's other guys there. If they have a big background in a certain industry or a certain yeah. sector and they're bringing contacts from their personal connections that they've made, well, then absolutely bring them on. But then you're not looking at them as a politician. You're looking at them yeah. as a professional in their field. So the I suppose it might be the same point that you were making, you know, about any kind of, you know, contractors or partnerships, you have to, you know, you have to make sure that they're, they're adding value. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. Think... That's, the, that's the word adding value. But, <laughs> but I, do, I do find, and again, it's only, only my opinion because I've seen it so much is because we are Northern Ireland, we still have this, this thing hanging over us. And um, the more we can detach away, I was with a client in England a couple of months ago, and just even the abuse we take about Stormont and we get, you know, getting paid <laughs> That they're actually, people's watching us, the world are watching us. So you don't really want to get your business and reputation involved in, in that, yeah. in my opinion. Terry, what about yourself? Yeah, well, I suppose I have a very neutral view in terms of politicians in general. But um, in terms of uh, the business approach, like I, I think like the strategic view, you know, should be held by councils and uh, across the, you know, the whole region. But it's very, very difficult to do that when you're in the business of winning votes. Um, so. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that, you know, until we sort of have a functioning sort of system here in the, in the North, um, I think it's going to be very difficult to make, you know, real strategic decisions because it's always seen perhaps as a sort of a, a, a lean towards one side or, or one community or the other, whatever you would agree to describe it. But, yeah. um, you know, as, as Stephen says, you know, I have to move past that and, you know, really see what's best for the, the, the country and actually, you know, try and, and try and look towards, you know, where where can we grow our businesses, you know, and what what can a local government do to um, provide to that, that and assist that support that exactly, you know what I mean? And, and you know, there's obviously been some bad decisions, you know, in the previous years there, but, you know, everybody... What, I think that's the key. It's just really looking yeah. ahead and, and not looking at the short term, but looking at the long term in terms of, you know, att uh, retaining our workforce, attracting them to invest, you know, in, in an external investment and, you know, supporting companies that are, are innovative and, and have potential to grow. You know what I mean? Yeah. And final word to you, Colin. Um, well, I think in terms of recruiting staff, you know, um, you know uh, politicians haven't, you know, as, uh, for me, hindered or helped. Um, and my only direct connection with politicians has really been on you know, the problems we've had as we manufacture, we have to source components and most of our components come from England. And of course, uh, you know, there's a big barrier which uh, we would like uh, removed. Um, and it's not just from England, we have suppliers in France, uh, Germany, Holland, Belgium, who refuse to supply us now. Um, uh, so, so, so those those issues that people don't really think about is how many suppliers just refuse to supply Northern Ireland, um, or or you have to send it from one supplier to another supplier. Uh, like we are sending stuff from Belgium to a friendly supplier in Germany just to be able to buy it. And so you end up with a 20 euro component cost you 100 euro. Um, so those barriers to trade, especially, you know, within the UK, um, I think those need to be addressed. And that's my only involvement with politicians is trying to get that. Um, well, pointing Absolutely. out the issues that we've got, you know, um, but in terms of employing staff, obviously it has been more difficult in the last you know, 12 months or so. If anybody's recruiting staff, you, you get a lot fewer people applying than you would have you know, five years ago. Yeah. So um, um, uh, now the, the upcoming recession might change that slightly uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, make it easier to, to recruit staff. But, but um, 
I say it has been difficult, um, yeah. even even creating one or two staff. You, you maybe get one or two applications where you previously you would have 80 or 100. Um, I know it has been, um, the labour market has been particularly tight and it doesn't look like mm-hmm. that's uh, changing anytime mm-hmm. soon. Um, but a big thank you uh, to all of our panellists, to Colin, Terry and Stephen. Thank you so much for giving up your time. I appreciate it. I think, Stephen, you're actually in an airport. So, you know, appreciate you all had to fit us in <laughs> to your uh, busy schedules. Um, I Just before I finish up, I also wanted to um, just open up to the webinar this uh, proposed idea that's come from the Mid-Southwest Partner Councils. They're considering setting up an industrial investment challenge fund um, and they would love to get some external engagement on that idea. They want, they think that's really important um, in terms of moving it forward. So they will be um, probably following up with an email to try and get some of your thoughts just on that proposed idea. And they will also be sending around um, a very short feedback form just to try and hear your feedback about today's uh, session to help try and design um, future programs. But thank you all so much for giving up your time to be part of today's event. And thank you too for those questions coming through uh, from those watching. And I'll now pass you over to Councillor Martin Kearney, who's going to close today's event. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to Colm, Stephen and Terry for sharing your inspiring business journeys and to Cloda for facilitating such an interesting workshop this morning. I'm sure you will agree this session has given us lots to think about in terms of how doing things differently and innovating can be used to create greater efficiencies within the day-to-day operation of businesses. Our panel have been insightful and have shared what drives them to innovate ensuring that their businesses continue to stay ahead of the competition. So I hope this session has encouraged you to think about starting or continuing your own innovation journey and how you too can grow and help to play a part in building on the Mid-Southwest reputation for innovation and enterprise. Thank you all very much.